Okay, so today we're talking about cryptography, and this is part one out of two parts, and second part's next semester if you're interested. Um, so cryptography is basically a subfield of security, and its objective is if an eavesdropper intercepts a message, they shouldn't be able to gain any additional information even if they see the message. So today we're just gonna be covering the basics and covering some definitions. Um, so yeah. So I'm gonna be using some of this vocabulary. It's very basic, but if you don't know it, um, plain text is just the original form of the message and uh, ciphertext is the encrypted version. And you use a key to turn a transform of plain text into a ciphertext using a set of rules. And then you have um, encryption, which is just changing the plain text into a ciphertext and decryption, which is recovering the message from the ciphertext. So qualities of a good um, encryption algorithm. Um, one thing is most, algor good, most algorithms that are used are theoretically breakable if you use brute force. Um, but the difference is a good encryption algorithm, you shouldn't be able to reduce the key space with, um, with using any intu intuition or logic. And so you may be asking, so when can you actually reduce the key space? And we're gonna look at the Caesar cipher for that. Okay, so um, if you're not familiar with the Caesar cipher, it's just a very simple encryption, um, encryption algorithm where you shift the alphabet over by a certain arbitrary number. And so if you look at this picture, like B becomes E and C becomes F and et cetera, and then you just substitute the characters based on that. And so why is it considered a weak encryption? If you use, if you know the fact that E is the most common um, used letter in the English alphabet, then you could just scan the cipher text or the encrypted text and see which letter is most frequently occurring and just use that sort of intuition to crack the code and figure out what the alphabet is shifted by. And thus you've reduced the key space by make, making an educated guess and um, you didn't have to brute force the algorithm. So there's two ways are two concepts when you're talking about cryptography. You have confusion and diffusion. Um, and there are two ways to kind of change up the meaning of a text when you're encrypting it. And so confusion is just when you exchange a symbol, symbols. So it's just substitution. So ciphertext is an example of confusion. And then you have diffusion, which is when you actually change the placement of the symbols. Um, so if you look at this example here um, for diffusion because that's something that most people aren't very familiar with. You basically have like a block here and when you um, write the message column order um, you see that the row order is completely different and you just take the row order to um, encrypt it and that ends up changing the text even though you're not substituting each character necessarily. And algorithms technically use both confusion and diffusion to achieve um, the goal. So stream ciphers are um, an example of simple substitution. And you basically just take a key stream, which is just an arbitrary string of zeros and ones, um, typically, and you just X or it in most simple case to create a cipher text. And the pros of stream ciphers are it's um, very high in speed um, and it's not very error prone because it's so simple. But it is low in diffusion and it's really easy for attackers to just insert random um, numbers into the uh, cipher text and just completely screw up the message when you're transferring it. And then block ciphers are an example of uh, diffusion. Uh, as we talked about before with the James Bond needs backup example, uh, you can just uh, pick an arbitrary block size. And in the most simple case, you would encrypt based on blocks. So if you look at this top picture, you break up the plain text into blocks and then you can encrypt each block individually. And then um, when you're decrypting, you also have to know the block size in order to decrypt it. And modern day block sizes are about 128 bits. Um, it's hard to tamper with, so that's good, but it is very slow because uh, you can only encrypt one block at a time. 
And it is error prone because it is a more complicated procedure. Okay, so now we know that encryption requires a key and you may be wondering if the whole point of encryption is to create a secure channel, then how do you get the key from person A to person B without it getting leaked? And that is known as the key distribution problem. And we'll, talk, we'll circle back to this later in the presentation, but know that I'm gonna cover that. So perfect ciphers are a concept in cryptography in that an ideal cipher, you shouldn't be able to gain the, an interceptor shouldn't be able to gain the message of the cipher, even if they have the encryption algorithm and the cipher text. And um, this sort of thinking requires the key, the key to be just as long as the plain text. So if we're looking at the one-time pad, um, it's theoretically a perfect cipher. Um, it's also a stream cipher because you just XOR the key with the plain text. And the key is as long as the plain text. So if you look at this example, the key is just a random um, binary string and you XOR it to get the cipher text. And it's extremely strong because when an attacker tries to um, decrypt the cipher and they just intercept the message, so they'll have the cipher text. Um, but the best way to explain this is it's extremely strong because even if they have the cipher text, it's very hard to get to the plain text because there are two to the end possible plain texts that could be the pre-image of the cipher text under a plausible key. So every possible plain text for that number of bits is possible under the right key because the key is just as long and when you XOR it, it gives you every possible combination. Feel free to stop me if anyone has any questions at any point. So then why don't we use it? So the problem with the one-time pad is, as the name suggests, you can only use it once. Um, and you need to create a new key for every iteration because if you can only use it once, then obviously you have to make a new key. And you need a secure channel to exchange that key. And if the key is the same length as a message and you have a secure channel to transfer that key, at that point, you might as well just use that secure channel to transfer the message itself um, because it's the same length. So again, we've encountered the key exchange problem. If you're curious as to why you can only use it once, if you look at this proof, um, when you XOR it, the K stands for the key. When you XOR it with the key two times for, for two messages, an interceptor that's had, who's been viewing this message transaction will be able to gain M1 XOR with M2. And while that may not seem that significant, it's still a memory leak. And therefore it's not, uh, good cipher and over time you can end up piecing together the message from that information. If you are curious to learn more though, you should look at the Vernum cipher. That's an approximation of the one-time pad that a lot of computers actually use now. So definitely check that out if you're interested. So then this brings us to symmetric and asymmetric encryption. And this kind of solves the one, the key distribution problem. So most ciphers in um, cryptography fall under these two categories. And symmetric is basically when you use the same key to encrypt and decrypt, as you can see in this picture. And um, yeah, some famous examples are AES and DES. If you're interested, definitely check that out. And asymmetric is when the same key is not used. Uh, there's typically a private and public key, which we'll get into. And um, it, some famous algorithms are RSA and Diffie-Hellman. So symmetric cipher, if you were paying attention, um, Caesar cipher is um, a symmetric cipher. Um, it's very easy, very fast and um, but the problem is you have the key distribution problem because if it's a symmetric encryption, you have to get that key um, through a secure channel. So you could either write it down or and give it to the person before you start communicating with them or you have to find some way to give that key to them. 
Now, asymmetric cipher can be a little confusing to wrap your head around if it's your first time doing this or hearing about it. And it's basically, like I said earlier, um, so there's a public key and a private key for each person in the message um, transaction. So if you look at this picture, uh, user one has um, user two's public key and the public key is used to encrypt any data. So user two's public key is um, common knowledge. Everyone knows what it is, but it only encrypts data. It doesn't decrypt data. So I can encrypt a message using uh, user two's public key, but I won't, no one else will be able to decrypt it. And in order to decrypt it, user two would have to use their private key to decrypt it. And it's a really great way to get messages across. And it's also a really good way to sign your messages because if um, I want someone to know that the message is coming from me and I have a private key that can encrypt a message, then I can use that private key to encrypt my message. And then that person that I'm sending the message to can use their public key to decrypt it. Um, and they'll know the message came from me because I'm the only one who has that encryption um, key. And so the pros are that it solves the key distribution problem, but the cons are it's extremely expensive to generate public keys and to encrypt um, messages using um, public keys because obviously it's very complicated math. Um, and generating these keys usually involves um, very large prime numbers because there's no polynomial time algorithm for that. And so trying to brute force something like that would be very hard um, for prime factorization. Okay, so this was a lot shorter than I thought it would be, <laughs> but we will be covering Diffie-Hellman and RSA next time, um, sometime next semester, I believe. So definitely stick around for that. And let me know if you have, does anyone have any questions? Because I know I went through a lot of information, a lot of quick, very quickly, and I would be more than happy to explain anything.